Good day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. I want to talk to you about the Trinity and us. Now, the idea here is to hopefully, you know, clarify the relationship we have with the Trinity, with God as a whole, and just to try to get a little better understanding of the aspects of God. So first, uh, the first thing I want to do, if you're if you're watching the video, um, there's a diagram here. If you're not, then if you're on the podcast, of course, you won't see this, but it's that triangular diagram that you'll see. And you'll notice that you've probably seen this before. Notice the Father is God, but he is not the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Son, Jesus, is God, but he is not the Father or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, but not the Father or the Son, Jesus. So they are all God. But they are all different facets of God or aspects. This is why we have instances where God refers to himself as us. The first time we see this in English is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Notice, it's let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, actually, in Hebrew, the first time we see a plurality of God is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, God, in verse 1, is actually the plural form of God in Hebrew, Elohim, or Elohim. I think it's Elohim. Pronunciation aside, the word for God is Elohim, which means, it is literally means gods. El means God, and then Elohim means gods, and then like If you have like El Shaddai, which we are somewhat familiar with that, that means God Almighty. El is God, and then Shaddai is Almighty. So our example of that would be in Genesis chapter 35, verse 11. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty. That is just an example of that. So Elohim is used over 2,000 times for God in the Old Testament. This is just to help us understand that God is the Trinity. He is all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now we need to go to how the Trinity relates to us as Christians, or how do we know these facets of God? First, there is God the Father. He is the designer of everything. He is the planner. He is the author of everything. He is our Heavenly Father, and like a good father, He is instructing us for our betterment. If you look in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. This that God the Father told the Israelites was for their betterment, and also for ours. Like a good father, God gives us clear instructions and explanations of how we should be, what he expects from us, He also points out the bad that will occur if we do not follow his teachings. Look at the next two verses, Deuteronomy chapter 30, 17 and 18. 
But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Now you may be tempted to say that this does not apply to us because we're not going to cross the River Jordan, but it it actually does in a spiritual sense we can apply this. Our promised land is the kingdom of heaven, which we will not enter or see if we do not follow the Father's instructions. But to let God explain for himself, see what he said through Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 48, verses 16 and 17. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Now the word profit there means teaches you to benefit. In other words, to do good for yourself, to be successful in things. It's not just about money or riches. God the Father leads us in the way that is best for us. If we will listen and follow, that's what Jesus did. If you look at John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, this is Jesus speaking. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Jesus spoke as God wanted and commanded. He does not contradict God. We also have God's word in our Bible, and that is what we should follow and speak. So now, let's look at the Son, Jesus. If God is the mind, the brain, the Father, Jesus is the word, the body. He is active. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Notice in verse 4, this life in him was life. It is a life Full, a full life devo- totally devoted to God that he showed us. Jesus is that light of God shining out in truth that dispels the darkness around us, the confusion in the world. If we look at John chapter 1, verse 14, just, just verses down from this beginning, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God sent Jesus for us to bring us out of Satan's clutches, out of that darkness and confusion. If we look at, again, a few verses down, John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The phrase used in verse 16, grace for grace, might be better understood as grace upon grace, or favor upon favor, or blessing upon blessing. In the Son, we have received Blessing on blessing, spiritual blessings on top of spiritual blessings. It speaks to how blessed we are through Christ the Son. Verse 17 tells us of the new covenant that Jesus brought to us again. Grace and truth, as was mentioned in the verse up above as well. The Son brought us unmerited favor with God and displayed and taught the true nature of God, and lived out that nature of love as one of us. 
Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He has freed us from sin and death. Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The Son brought us into right standing with God by nailing our transgressions to the cross, by circumcising our hearts and raising us up with him in baptism. He removed every obstacle for us, erased all those things held against us. Jesus defeated the powers of darkness for us. He shamed and disgraced them for all to see, to make them powerless and to show. This is, this is what the public spectacle was. He shamed and disgraced them so everyone could see they were powerless. Jesus is also our older brother who has set an example for us to follow. Romans chapter 8 verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Paul is talking about us, that God wants us, all of us, to be like the Son, Jesus. When we do that, follow the Lord, then Jesus is our brother, our older brother, the firstborn. He is the firstborn of many making us a part of God's family, making us God's children. Jesus also promised us the Holy Spirit when he was speaking to the apostles before he was to die. John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The Spirit will guide us into all truth. In other words, for us, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the Bible, the Word of God. He also reminds us of the Word, the meaning, and how we should act accordingly. He does not help us remember chapter and verse. That's a man-made thing. It's a tool that can help you in memorizing. Some people are good at this and some aren't. I'm, I'm not very good at that. But knowing and retaining the meaning, that we can all do. And the Holy Spirit does help us with that. Note that like Jesus, the Spirit does not speak under his own authority. He's only going to speak God's truth, God's word, He does not contradict God or Christ. Notice what else Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice if we follow the Lord, he will send the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will help us and aid us. He will dwell with us and in us. The world cannot receive him. Only believers can receive him. So if we believe and follow the Lord, then the Holy Spirit is in us. In a way that seems either crazy or miraculous, why would any part of God want to dwell in us? And you might think that this 
was just for the apostles. But see this, John chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. Now that's just um, a little further down than where we were. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now notice, he says, if anyone loves me, and we count as a part of anyone. Here, Jesus the Lord says that he and the father will come and make their home with anyone that will love him and keep his word. Same as always, the Lord requires that we follow his instructions, which are actually better for us anyway. Then we will have this blessing. Now, the requirement is always the same. Love God and love each other. Because if we're doing those things, we will be fulfilling everything else. So, a few quick examples just to make sure we understand. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. If we love each other, God abides in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. In other words, if we are following in the faith, then Jesus Christ is in us. The same requirement, it's just stated differently. Paul believed in being critical of ourselves instead of others, which is a much better practice. But that is a different topic. But that's why he stated it the way he did. Examine ourselves. And we should examine ourselves. Then Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. If we are in the body, following the Spirit, if we follow the Lord and are in the faith, if we have been baptized, then the God and Father of all is in us. Then another time, Paul reminds us of something else. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So this is the third part. So the Bible definitely states that every aspect of the Trinity is in us, and it's stated many different ways. But the Father is in us, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or God as the complete God, Paul reminds us that the Holy Spirit is in us and we are the temple of God. So again, why would God do this? Why would God reside in us? Because we are the temple that God made for himself. A temple made by our hands is not good enough. If you look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 25, and if you make me an altar of stone, You shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Now, this was God speaking to the Israelites. Anything we make is flawed and imperfect. If you remember, the temple and the ark were only good enough because they were made by God's design, and they had to be made exactly as he said. But Paul explains that being brought near to God by the blood of Jesus changes us. Okay? Being brought near to God by the blood of Jesus changes us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. As we follow the Lord, we are changed and built into a temple for God. God molds us and makes us a fit dwelling. If we back up to chapter 2, verse 10 of Ephesians, we're just backing up a few verses, really. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are God's work, his craftsmanship. He makes us into what we were always supposed to be. And this is a wonderful blessing to have God in us, to be molded into his temple. But it also carries a great responsibility. Notice what else Paul said about us being the temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, we had read verse 16 earlier. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. As the temple of God, we do not want to defile ourselves, so we want to make sure we keep ourselves holy, separate for God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, this was Paul again talking to the Corinthians and reminding them they are the temple of God and that they should be holy and separate. Notice, he says, now this is God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. God dwells in us if we follow him and do not let other things come between us and God. Anything we put in front of God is an idol, and we are not to walk according to the flesh. In other words, we're not to walk in our old ways. If we look here um, at Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 17 here, Paul is talking about how we should not walk in the world according to the flesh, fulfilling earthly desires. Again, this is Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 17. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So he's saying we are debtors, but not to the flesh. We're debtors to the Spirit, right? But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, meaning we're living by the Spirit, and we're not doing those bad deeds, we're not walking according to the flesh. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, again, Christ's siblings, God's family, his children, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, there, Paul is basically saying, if indeed we suffer with him, if we follow Christ, if we follow Jesus and do like we should. So I hope these thoughts and ideas will be a blessing to you. We want to remember that we are God's children, that we also, we like the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we have a mind, we are in a body, we have a body, and we have a spirit. We want to remember that we are a child of God, that's how we were made to be and meant to be. 
want, we want to remember that we are the temple of God. We are his children. He has fashioned us into a suitable home for himself. That means the Father, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. For they are all God, and God is in us if we follow the Lord and love each other. Remember to love God and love each other. So I want to thank you for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. May God bless you and keep you safe always. And remember, God loves you.